From Content360, this is the state of client acquisition. Hey, we are live. Welcome to this presentation about what I would do if I had to start making money on LinkedIn from scratch. This is going to be a very detailed, tactical, but also principle questioning uh, presentation. And I'm really looking forward to you getting a lot of value out of it. Frankly, this is effectively the condensed version of the entire training that is the Alpha Lead Academy, which is the main product that we are selling. And so I just, I mean, it's just purely out of time constraints that I couldn't pack in everything. Otherwise, I wouldn't have minded, but I thought that I would share a condensed version of what I would do. Hey, Kevin, good to see you. And uh, I hope that you will all get a lot of value out of it. All right, let's get straight into it. Why should you listen to me? First of all, uh, in 2021, I won 29 new clients on LinkedIn from complete stranger within one to two weeks. On average, most of these clients have come from, I think all of them have come from LinkedIn, vast majority for sure. I sell a five to seven and a half K marketing and sales coaching package to solopreneurs and small B2B owners. And everyone who applies my methods consistently gets at least three X ROI results within maximum eight months. It used to be it used to be three months, but then I had one client who did need a little bit more time. So now I have to be truthful and it is eight months, but um, but that those are the results of this methodology. Hey, Jeremy, good to see you as well. All right, let's get into it. So the, the idea for this presentation came when I, uh, I relatively recently passed the 10,000 follower mark. And I was thinking, well, what would I have to do if suddenly these followers were all gone? and I wouldn't have any connections. Not that I was planning to breach any LinkedIn rules, dear overlords who you are listening, that was definitely not the plan. But in case that would have happened, what would I actually do? And so this is where the idea came from and I was just thinking hard on what I do and this is the result. So this is very high level. Let's get started and uh, get started with the idea right away. So this is how I would allocate my time if I had, let's say, 40 hours a week on the table, you can see it. I would say 10% uh, time I would spend uh, connecting, 20% I would spend on creating a video podcast, 12.5% my own content, 25% commenting on other people's content. This is a really, really important part. And then 25% prospecting. We're going to get to that in, there are a few cases where you don't need to do prospecting, but this is what I would do. And then I'd leave a couple of hours available for admin. And the allocation is depending on how much time you have. If you say, okay, I just want to get started on LinkedIn. I don't have all of that much time. I have 10 hours a week. Then simply apply the same split as I suggested in the percentages here. Cool. Okay. But first, before we get into the specific tactics, we really have to talk about your offer because sure, you could be selling a $199 product or charge your consulting services by the hour. And many people do that, of course. And honestly, there's many legit ways how you can build a sort of a groundswell of a following that then would allow you to sell a product that you then don't have to be selling one on one. But there's a couple of good reasons why you should have a high priced offer, maybe even as well, complementary to the low priced offer, because of the following reasons. First of all, selling on Zoom there's the same amount of effort to sell a $1,000 deal as it is a $10,000 deal. The only difference is the audience that you are selling it to. There's this famous meme going around where a person sends you a message, okay, I hope this is a big investment for us, these $500, and I hope that you will uh, be a transformation element in our lives, that somebody receives this kind of email. And then another email is, all right, I wired the 50K. Let's, when, when, when are we getting started? And so it's really that the, the people who you are selling to at a $10,000 mark tend to be much more mature, goal-driven, action-oriented, and don't see this as a big deal. They do that very often. For people for whom a 1,000 deal needs to be sold to one-on-one, -on -one, they are generally tend to be a little, little bit more difficult, very demanding, very... Um, yeah, demanding effectively. And so you'd want to avoid selling at a low price. If you sell a low price, by all means, but then do it 
via a landing page where people just take out their credit card and pay, where you don't do one-on-one. -on -one. Another reason why you might want to sell a high-priced offer is you need way fewer deals to get by per month, obviously. And then also you practice confidence. I now I'm working with a client for whom confidence on a sales call is really the big issue. And it is quite a big deal because when you before you've only received deals via referrals or word of mouth, generally speaking, that is quite a tall order if you have to approach and sort of hunt your own prey. And if you have to do that, being able to practice confidence with people where, okay, if you lose, no big deal. My One of my clients, the one I mentioned, he is uh, recently, I think he overall clocked in 21 calls. And for him, it's really a confidence issue. And he was he's struggling with that. None of those calls advanced to a later stage. And so we really are working on the confidence side of things because it's... Yeah, it's just important that you're able to sell yourself. And to be able to practice that on your end is really good because it's then going to cascade into so many other different areas of your life. Also, you give clients premium service. And that's a, that's a great thing because you, just today, I had a great conversation with one of my other clients. We are really digging into his motivations, for example. And we just uncovered that simply he lacks a certain level of meaning in why he is doing what he's doing. And so we spend quite a bit of time exploring that, exploring it on his end, what would give him meaning. And we just spent the last two coaching sessions on just this topic. And it was just one-on-one. -on -one. And the reason why I'm perfectly happy to do that is because I charge a one-off fee upfront and we are solving a problem for him. So I can take the time to really go in depth because I'm giving my clients premium service and they pay a premium price. Cool. So here's the boxes that your high value offer should tick. If so far you've been selling yourself short, if you underselling yourself, here are the high value offer requirements. First of all, it should be targeted obviously at a willing and able to pay clientele. I recently spoke to somebody who was selling a really good package. I don't remember exactly what it was. I remember this really impressed me, but it was to primary public primary schools. And he just realized that they just were the, the red tape he would have to go through. It would take forever to get this. And they usually didn't regard the problem as so burning that they would actually be willing to free up a budget that would be worth his time, right? So it should be targeted, willing, and able to pay clientele. It also should be somehow transformational, a sort of a from to. And it also, that's closely connected to the topic that it needs to solve a difficult, hairy, complex problem. So it cannot just be, I'm going to create your logo, right? That is, unless you are a celebrity designer, it's going to be difficult to create a, a high price offer on that because it is not all that difficult or complex, unless you are already a very established company, then there's agencies who do that. But if you're an average B2B, small B2B company, it's not a difficult problem to create a logo, right? So it needs to be transformational and a complex problem. For example, the topic of client acquisition, right? I am in this space. It's a, <laughs> this is going to be a problem as long as the earth is spinning. Client acquisition will always be a problem and a difficult one. And so this is what I help my clients solve. Anything that has to do, for example, with digital transformation. This is, of course, not an exhaustive list, but just a few examples taking a company and taking them from old school methods to digitally native, so to speak, that is a complex thing. But also outside of B2B, if you, for example, look at something as delicate as porn addiction, one of my clients is helping his clients to solve that. That is a very difficult and very complex problem, right? And so clearly transformational thing, this is worth a high value price tag. And theoretically, it should also offer an unlimited upside, right? Because theoretically, one of my clients could, and one of my clients actually has, to has achieved a, we stopped counting because he got himself a, a retainer client, which paid him, I believe, some three, 4,000 pounds a month. And he's had that for the last one and a half years, as far as I know. And so this is like a huge upside, right? He paid once to get in. And with the methods that he learned from me, he then now got a retainer client that is that keeps paying, right? And so it's a theoretically unlimited upside. Once you learn this stuff, then you're going to have a better life. Similarly, if we stay with the topic of porn addiction, if you are able to solve that, the upside is huge. You know, vastly improved relationships. You don't feel like 
like a like a sore loser and so on, right? So all of that huge upside here. Then finally, be high priced enough that you wouldn't resent clients who need well above average attention. This was exactly what I was talking about right now. This was already the second session that I spend with my clients exploring his why, why does he do what he does? And I don't mind that at all. I really enjoy this because I charge a high enough price that this is absolutely worth my time. Okay, so how to create a high priced offer using your rare and valuable skills. Very nuts and bolts here. Let's get into it. Your offer should tick as many of the following boxes as possible. It should have a clearly defined target audience. It should describe a transformation for that audience. It should mention or at least hint at your methodology or ideally something called a unique mechanism. I'm not going to get into the very deep details here, but as competition rises, you need to tell people how you will help them achieve their goal. And that is called a unique mechanism. It should also be very clear and unambiguous, and it should use language that your target audience recognizes and uses. It should not be what you dream up, but it should be what they recognize and use. And ideally, it should include one or two words or symbols that are unusual, that catch people's attention. And this is now very specific on how do you frame your offer in the context of LinkedIn, right? This is how you would put it as a LinkedIn headline. So this is mine. I say, I help small B2B companies and solopreneurs build client acquisition systems by splitting their funnel into a one, high intent conversion machine, and two, a nurturing content environment, right? And you can see by the colors, so the small B2B companies and solopreneurs is a clearly defined target audience, then build client acquisition systems. This is the transformation that I help them do. It resonates with them because I help them build systems. It's not just a haphazard, you know, oh, get a client here by starting conversations. No, it's a, it's a whole system and framework behind it. And then I talk about my unique mechanism. This is by splitting your funnel into a conversion machine and a nurturing content environment. So try to follow this framework, target audience, transformation, and methodology or unique mechanism this is how you create a great offer that should be worth at least $3,000, preferably more than that. Okay, and now let us we have to talk about a sort of sensitive subject. You have to look at your cash needs, and this will determine which of the activities that you can see in the pie chart that I copied it here again, of all the like connecting, podcast, own content, commenting, and prospecting, what of these you need to do. And now we have to talk about outbound prospecting, because this is quite a special beast. Outbound prospecting, in case you don't know, is the act of approaching someone. It used to be just on the phone or even going door to door and knocking on their doors, metaphorically or real, and ask them, hey, is this something that you would be interested in? Do you, do you want this? And of course, it is unpleasant because you get a lot of rejection in this context, but it also works. And so, we have to look at whether we want to do this because we want to do it only in two specific scenarios. Number one is to quickly validate an offer. And here in this presentation, that would go outside of the scope. But let's say you so far has been, have been only serving clients in a very niche, narrow area. For example, let's say for the sake of the argument, it is the topic of you have helped them to design their logo, okay? And you, you did this for $500. And now you are going beyond that and you are helping them with a more transformational offer. You say, for example, one of my clients actually does that. He helps CEOs to feel less ashamed about what their business looks like, all their online presence that CEOs who are ashamed of that, right? You need to validate that offer. It sounds like a really high valuable offer, but you need to validate that. And in this case, in this scenario, you need to validate it. And you do this by outbound prospecting is one of the ways because you simply want to get a quick proof that this is actually worth the money that you hope it will be. And you don't want to wait for months just by doing content and doing podcasting and so on until someone finally comes to you and asks about your services. You actually want to quickly validate that. And so in this case, you would do some outbound prospecting where you start conversations with people directly. And in the second scenario, and this is why I mentioned the cash needs in the beginning, is you want to make client acquisition a little bit more predictable. Because the fact is, if you are starting from zero, then it's going to take a while before your content in itself is going to deliver you clients. 
right? It is simply a truth. We have to accept that. And there are several gurus who deny this because they have like a followership of 100,000 people plus, and they cannot even imagine what it's like to not get any inbound leads. And they can teach their methods and they basically tell their clients, you have to be patient, patient, patient. Well, sometimes we simply cannot be patient. We cannot wait. We have to get a few clients through the door. And for this, outbound prospecting is the key because it's much more predictable. On average, you will be when you're starting out, you will need 150, maybe worst case, 200 conversation starts to get one client. In my case, I've been doing this for a while now. I've done a total of over 2,000 conversation starts, and I'm by now on a 100 conversation starts required to get one client. Okay, so this is these are the scenarios in which we are doing up on prospecting. So if, I would recommend the following. If your need for cash is really urgent, if you say, okay, I just need to get something through the door really quickly, then I would say spend 80% of your time prospecting and do one written and one video post per week and some commenting. If your cash needs are medium, then do look at that pie chart split that we discussed in the beginning. 10% of your time connecting, 20% do a podcast, 12.5% content, 25% commenting, and 25% prospecting. And if it's a non-issue, if you have plenty of savings and you just want to grow and get that groundswell of support, of groundswell of building an audience, then don't do outbound prospecting at all. And instead, really expand the content side of the pie in equal proportions. So to simply more of podcast, more of your own content, and more commenting. Cool. So with that said, starting at zero, this is what I would do, assuming I have 40 hour weeks and I have a medium cash urgency and I am competent and have a track record. If you have not yet had success in your domain, this is really not for you. You will need to follow a completely different playbook. But with this, what I'm telling you, showing you is if you have been a consultant for a while, coach, consultant, small B2B, then this is what I would recommend you to do. All right. Uh, so we would do, first of all, let's look at connecting. This would take you four hours a week. And why do we do connecting? Well, of course, you need to grow your audience, especially when you're starting at zero. And there you can follow us, follow a simple three-step process. I would say find 20 ideal clients, identify 10 influencers whose content they consume, bookmark the influencer's content feed, daily check their content feed and click on their posts like button open up the likers who look relevant to you and open the profile in a new tab you do that by hitting control and click and then add them one by one saying hi name i see we're both fans of influencer and his content influencer and his content would be great to connect on here and yes i thought this was a three-step process when i was writing this slide and it has turned into a six-step process so i apologize but it's a six-step process. It's still pretty simple. And this gets me a 70 to 80% connection rate. That is unheard of if you are, for example, using Sales Navigator. And this is a really important principle to understand because if you understand it, it will help you greatly with your other type of conversations that you have on LinkedIn. Why? Because people are way more interested in content than they are in their own demographic details. Right? Because if you add people via Sales Navigator, for example, and you just say, okay, I want HR, VPs of HR in companies, 100 to 500 people, and so on, and then you get a list, and then you start adding them. Well, what is the way that you will phrase the invitation to connect? There is nothing really there that you can use. Right? Oh, hello, I see you are a VP of HR at this company. Awesome. Would be lovely to connect. Terrible. And that's why you get a pretty lousy connection rate. When I started doing this, I had like a 10, 12% connection rate doing this. Horrible. But if you connect with people over content that they engage in, it has several benefits. First of all, you, you are much more likely to get a response because they are active on LinkedIn. People on Sales Navigator are not very active, generally, as an average. And also because you are connecting with them over something that they had an emotional reaction to, meaning they had a like, they, they clicked like, then you're much more likely to connect with them. And this is how I get a 70, 80% connection rate. So, and there I recommend that you do 18 connections per week there. Remember, LinkedIn allows you only 100 connections per week, maximum 30 a day. So if you use Sales Navigator, you're not gonna get all that many connections. If you use this method, you're gonna get way more connections. Okay, and so here's, a 
because I just wanted to show it to you. This is one of my favorite people on, on LinkedIn, Justin Welsh, and you simply go to his post, you then click on the likes. This is what you then get. You get all those people who liked, and then you click on them while holding the control key, that's Windows, I think it's Command on Mac, and you just click on them and you see how they open in the new tabs at the top. Once they're open, you then write, Hi, name. I see we're both fans of Justin Welsh in this case, and his content would be great to connect on here. You copy that message, and then you hit send, and then you paste it into the next person's invitation field, simply adjusting the name. And that way, you can you can easily hammer out 18 connection requests in 45 minutes. I think it's going to be way less. I do this in like 15, 20 minutes because I know the people who I already have to go to. Boom, boom, boom. Open it. Send them and. And and uh, yeah, I have a great connection rates with this. Brian, thank you very much for the lovely comment. Fantastic sharing coaching. Thank you, Brian. Okie doke, let's look at point two out of five. Start a podcast eight hours a week. This is a great book that I have found, which serves as the backbone for a lot of my podcasting. It's by James Carberry, and it's called Content-Based Networking. Big shout out to James here. He's also great on LinkedIn. Definitely follow him. And he, def you should also get definitely get his book. By the way, get the audiobook. It's awesome. He narrates it himself. Very engaging storyteller. And why should you start a podcast? Well, first of all, it's a great excuse to speak to people who normally wouldn't talk to you. Uh, then learn about your industry. It gives you, especially if you're relatively new, if you're pivoting with your offer, if you don't have much experience in your industry, then using this method will really help you learn a lot because you connect with people and this is what the book is all about, especially when you enter a new industry. That's how you learn about what the people actually care about rather than just some high level annual report type uh, businessy stuff. Also, video lends itself greatly to be reused as clips. Right? We all know that we have to do video on LinkedIn, that's all clear, but simply standing there and speaking into a camera, it's fine, but having the camera running while you are talking to someone and you're asking smart questions, you may be adding your own perspective, that lends itself way better to then be reused and chopped up into clips. It's also way more efficient time-wise to do that. So record a podcast, record yourself, and then ask a video editor. We're going to cover that a bit later. You, They should cut it up into clips and then share the clips with you so you can use them as short form content on LinkedIn and on YouTube. And yeah, long form content is greatly relationship building, right? Is, is, is relationship building on steroids with your target market. Cool. So what do you need to start a podcast? It can sometimes sound so daunting. Oh my God, podcast, like what kind of tech do I need? And so it's actually not all that much. You simply need an audio and video setup and a decent mic and a decent webcam should do it. So don't worry too much about that, right? And then you need a name for your podcast. And there's a really cool tip. Make the name something that your slightly more prominent guests, you know, the people who are like, you know, one or two good levels above you, who are like aspirational for you to get, that they would actually enjoy bragging about or mentioning to their network. So if they, for example, said, well, yesterday I was interviewed on the blah, blah podcast, right? So if it's, for example, Marketing Mastery, and if it's Joe Smith was, in, was interviewed on the Marketing Mastery podcast, well, that kind of means that he's a marketing master. So make sure that your podcast has this kind of name that sounds nice and aspirational for your audience. And you need a podcast logo because you're going to be uploading it to all the podcasting platforms. You need some kind of reasonably professional looking logo. You can get that on Fiverr. Just search for podcast logo. You're going to get a billion results of people who can do that for a couple of bucks. Do invest a tiny bit more. I would, in these two cases, I would invest in the one that offers it for $23 rather than for $7.85. It's going to be better looking. It's a small investment that's worth it. And then get yourself an anchor.fm and a YouTube account if you don't already have a YouTube account. What does anchor.fm do? It just uploads the podcast and that's just for the audio file because YouTube, you can use the video file, of course. But for anchor.fm, it just uploads the audio file into all the different platforms. So you only have to write the show notes once and you only have to upload the video, the audio once and it then gets it into Spotify, Google Podcasts and Apple. I'm sure there's others, but those are the three main ones. Also optionally, you can have a dedicated landing page for the podcast, not absolutely necessary, especially don't bother with it when you are starting out. 
Okay, quickly, just to give you an idea, this is my podcasting workflow, and it has been interrupted in the last month. I haven't released a podcast recently. This is now the the first one in a month that I'm doing. I just was way too busy with serving my clients, but this is now my normal podcasting workflow. So let's call it day zero. I record the episode, and right after recording, I'm going to be doing this right after this uh, live is over. I'm going to record a quick one to two minute audio intro. It's just something where I that I use to introduce the episode. And then I will upload the Zoom file, the intro file. And if I have, not in this case, but if I have a high-res video file of me to Google Drive and share the link with my video editor. Then I upload the high-res video file to YouTube and share the link with my virtual assistant who selects clips. Right? I have a virtual assistant who then selects clips. I'm going to show you how to do that. And then on day one, my virtual assistant has selected the clips. I share the clip instruction with the video editor. On day two, I receive the edited episode and the clips. I upload the episode to YouTube and Anchor. I add the show notes. I hit publish. I email my audience about the new episode. And I send a thank you email to the guest with links to episode and the files. And then later, the three, four, five clips from the podcast get shown the week after as short form content on LinkedIn and on YouTube. So that is my workflow for the podcast. Uh, Brian, typically like-minded and valued, more natural flow for connection. Great. I don't know if that's referring to me, but thank you for the comment, Brian. Good. So let us look at, after we covered podcast, now your own content. Of course, podcast is also your own content, but this is what I mean now on LinkedIn specifically. This is what I would do to get my own followership uh, blooming and flowering for five hours a week. So of course, use the clips from the podcast and add good written content to it. The video, very importantly, the clips, they need title and captions. Use a service called capwing.com for this. Do two to three video posts and text and two to three text posts a week. So let's say you use two clips of the video. You then upload them into Capwing, add the captions, add your branding. I'm gonna show you an example of that. And then when you publish that video, also add text that tells people who don't wanna watch the video what the video is about. Add value in the text itself. So that's, let's say, two video posts. And then in addition, you also create three text posts every week, right? And you just do that. This should take you hopefully really no more than five hours a week. Definitely what I really recommend, it makes a huge difference, study good copywriting. Especially I mentioned Justin Welsh already. I'm recently on a quite a Justin Welsh trip, so he's really good in that. Follow him and analyze how he does content, how he writes, what are the three lines that are always the most important ones, the three lines that gets people hooked so that they start reading the rest of the content. Study that. You will learn a ton. And of course, focus is on value to the audience. Don't try to write too much about your own thoughts, your own ideas, unless they are you know, valuable to the audience, of course. And do, opin do be opinionated. Be opinionated and polarizing. Vanilla won't win, win you any friends. Final uh, advice here, always publish at the same time. People will start noticing and it builds good habits. And it's also perceived as quite professional, right? If you have a daily routine, people like that, they kind of think highly of you if you, if you do that. Cool. Yeah, so this is the screenshot I wanted to show you. Those of you only on audio, sorry for that, but there's a great, uh, uh, it's like a table that I use that I give as a template to my virtual assistant because this is what she does once she receives the file, okay? There's a couple of columns. There's, imagine it's a column A where it says, give it the number. Uh, column B is not so important. Column C, this is the clip contents where she summarizes what the clip that she selected is about. She then adds a timestamp where the clip starts. And then what are the words that should be included that start that clip? And then where the clip ends and what are the last words of that clip? She selects that. She creates this table. And then I share this table with uh, my video editor, who then cuts the clips out of the long form video. And that is terrific. I don't have to do all that much. She's very smart. She knows what kind of clips I want to see usually. I've given her my instructions. And this is what she does then every week. She selects the clips and my video editor does the Thing. And by the way, if you're interested in how to hire a virtual assistant, I'm going to quickly share 
the link to the video where I covered this very topic on how to hire a virtual assistant. I'm going to add it into the comments now. You can take a look. We've covered this on a recent LinkedIn Live. Okie doke. All right. And yeah, this was the cap. This was Capwing, which is the, although I heard recently that it's supposed to be pronounced Capwing, but I prefer to use say Capwing, more natural. Use Capwing for title, colors, and captions. It's free up until a certain limit. I don't know what the latest limitations are, but it's a really good tool that automatically creates captions for the video. And you just add it. You have to edit them a little bit. They're not always perfect, but you can just add that, add a title, and the video looks much more captivating. The, the captions are super important because obviously not everyone is watching the videos with sound on, right? People will just have sound off and only if they see the first few seconds that it's interesting, they would then start listening to it and turning on the sound. Cool. Let us now get at commenting on others' content. This is a recent comment that I placed that was very popular. Uh, based on the size of that person's following. So this is a recent connection of mine called Carol. She asked about, I have a serious question for all of you, how should she allocate if she has one hour a day on LinkedIn? And so she asked, she tagged me in that post. So of course I responded. And it's important, I at least believe, that you really go above and beyond. I, whenever I get a specific question like that, or even when I even believe that it's a well-followed person, it's an it's a influencer on LinkedIn, and I could actually provide a good perspective on what I think a topic deserves, then I go really above and beyond and I max out the character count in that comment. Because people perceive that, they see, wow, this is really valuable, and then they start commenting. I definitely, I got two clients from just based on a comment that I know for sure, I believe there were more even who came to me because of my commenting. So it's definitely valuable and it works. And especially commenting is especially valuable when you have a low followership, right? Because you could have you could have five followers. And if you place a great comment on somebody else's content, that skyrockets you. Suddenly you're going to have viewers of your profile and going to be perceiving you that you would never have gotten if you just posted your content. So definitely include commenting. I would say, especially if you're starting at a really low level, prioritize commenting over posting your own content. Uh, this was an example of a comment to response to call. So this is uh, Justin Welsh who posted and I commented on this. Somebody said, that sounds interesting. What do you do? I'd like to learn more. And boom, we were on a call. This is how you bookmark influencers activity feeds. Just look, go on somebody's activity and go on, click posts, and then you just bookmark that. You bookmark page, and every day when it's time for your commenting routine, just click open 10 of your influencers pages and go to work. So specifically, this is what my bookmarked influencers, and by the way, who did I choose? I choose people who my ideal clients are following. And you see in some of those, I have noted at what time they post. Right, Jason Vanna at 2 to 2, 2.05 p.m., Justin Welch at 2.15, Rand Fishkin at 7 p.m. This is my book. These are my bookmarks of influencers. I then click on them, open them in new tabs, and boom, I start commenting. Okay, that's a great routine to establish for yourself. Oh, and this is great. Commenting masterclass. Figure out their time of day and be the first to comment. Because some influencers always post at the same time of the day. And this is really the culmination of a LinkedIn win-win. So their wide reach gives the first comments wide reach in return. And they benefit from fast accumulation of comments in the golden hour. The golden hour is the one hour directly after posting something where the level of engagement will determine the life, the future life of that post. So they benefit very much from it. So that's why it's a win-win. You get reach, they get additional views on their content. So here's the workflow. Step one, see if your influencer of choice always posts at the same time. Look at the time of day. It's not perfect on LinkedIn because you only see like six hours ago. Well, the next time, next day, see if around that time you get, you're getting closer. Then step two, if it's not obvious, ask them because it's beneficial for them. They will be glad to tell you. This is what I did with Jason. I asked him, hey, Jason, you always post at the same time. Would like to try to always be one of the first to comment. And he says, yes, for the most part, I usually go right around 7, 7.05 a.m. CST. So they will tell you they're happy to do that. 
and then note it in your bookmarks and set the recurring calendar reminder. So this is why you see my two timestamps here for Justin and for Rand. And then step four at the right time of day, try to be among the first commenters. Cool. Quickly, commenting rules. I'm really emphasizing this a lot because especially when you are starting out, commenting is the most important thing that you will be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And the one that will, if you do it well, will make the biggest difference for you. Your own content will take a while to get traction. The podcast is great because you're building one-to-one -one relationships. But in terms of getting you wide reach, commenting, us, commenting is super, super important. Okay, a couple of rules for how to do good commenting. First of all, be supportive but do add value. Never, ever, ever just go, great post. You know, even if you phrase it more in a flourishing way, this is a wonderful post that I'm so happy that you posted this. Nah, this is not good because it's counterproductive. Why? It makes them look like they are in an engagement pod. If you don't know what this is, an engagement pod is basically a small group of people who are constantly commenting on each other's posts so that they give them artificial boost and is highly disingenuous. And I believe that by now LinkedIn knows that it's happening. It still gets you additional boost, but it's like it's this Frankenstein version of posts where people always say, great post, thanks for your posting, and so on. Horrible. So don't make them look like they are in a pod. That's what would happen if you just said great post. Cool. You can, of course, thoughtfully disagree, but I recommend that you keep it to maximum 20% of total comments where you're thoughtfully disagreeing because otherwise you're a bit of a know-it-all. Only tag the person if the content of your comment warrants it. For example, if you want to get their attention, don't just tag them every single time you do that. It's a little bit annoying because if they're any good, they will respond to every comment anyway because they know that it gets them further engagement if they respond. And by the way, bonus points for tagging someone who you've had a relevant conversation with recently. So if somebody puts a good content, I comment on it and I realize, hey, this is what we talked about. Kevin, for example, with you, right? So we talked about that recently. I tag you because this adds value to you. I tag you, suddenly the influencer wins a new viewer and it's all this beautiful win-win, this sharing party on LinkedIn. This is what it's all about, right? You have to add people, you have to bring them into the conversation. Everybody loves that and everybody wins in this case. And of course, whenever somebody responds to your comment, then like every response and respond to those that warrant it. So basically, I can just summarize it. Just be nice. Don't be too critical and engage with everything that comes your way. And of course, like and respond to every comment on your own content. Cool. Now, let us look at this topic of outbound prospecting, right? We just now covered the first five. We said we have to add people. We have to create a podcast for the relationship building and long-form content. We have to create our own content and we have to comment on others' content. Now, what do we need to do in outbound prospecting? And this is now, just to give you an idea, this is your entire target market. You have the 5% on the left-hand side who are willing and able to invest working with you. Then there's the 5% on the other side who are the haters and the opposition. They will never work with you. But in between is the big ocean of indifference. These are people who are not problem aware, maybe not solution aware, or they are aware, but there's low priority for them to solve it. Or it is high priority, but they cannot afford to work with you or there's other inhibiting factors. This is your entire spectrum of your clients. Towards the left-hand side of this equation, you know, on the side of people who are more likely to work with you, there are the candidates for outbound prospecting. They may have heard about you. They may have seen your stuff on LinkedIn, but they are maybe sometimes a little bit lazy and they just don't believe that they, if they reached out to you, that you could help them. You can effectively, by doing good outbound prospecting, nudge them along a little bit. And I know what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm Even this year, I, I stopped doing outbound prospecting recently, but, well, not recently, like half a year ago, but until the mid midpoint of uh, this year, I, I believe I want like 12 or 13 clients via outbound prospecting alone. And the, they are there on that side of that spectrum, right? Because sometimes they just simply don't want to take action themselves. You need to help them along a little bit. So this is what we do in our prospecting approach. 
we don't just simply connect and pitch lab. That's horrible practice. We don't just connect and say, hey there, we have this, we have this really beautiful product. You should buy from us. No, no, no. That's not a good idea. Instead, you start with an opener and build rapport. The goal of this stage is simply get them to respond, ideally with more than one word. And you, of course, the goal is to build rapport with them. And the risks and mistakes that people make at this point is to be boring, to ask a boring question and getting stuck in limbo simply because it's comfortable. And of course, being too salesy, that's the biggest problem at this at this stage. Also, also displaying low status, right? It's a very bad idea when you are just very, oh, yeah, I saw you You're so impressive and everything about you is so wonderful and so on. Ah, not very good. So during that phase, these are the things to be mindful of. During the exploration phase, which is, of course, the longest, the goal is to not to sell to them, but find out if you might be a fit, if they have a problem that you are able to help them solve. At this stage, the risks and mistakes are when you ask too many questions, not going for the close, displaying low status again. And then finally, you get to the close. And by the way, all of this is very theoretical. I'm going to show you a very good example of that uh, on one of my prospecting conversations. So, And then you go to the close, and simply the close is get them to agree to a 15-minute intro call. And the risks and mistakes being committed here is simply not doing it, being too timid or doing it too early. So you have to catch the right moment. And this is a good example of one of my outbound prospecting conversations. I've only changed the name. Everything else is exactly as the conversation went. I'm not going to get into all the details. If you want, you can then take a screenshot and just look at the whole uh, conversation. But here you see this is the opener. I did not do a great job here at building rapport. But I just simply started to ask the question out of curiosity, if you're running on your business full time, are you trying to make it real big? We're talking six or seven figures. Or are you more the work to live type? That is, I would not be doing this anymore. It's just very salesy directly. But some people respond to it. And uh, in this case, the person says, I'm already making six figures. And then I go into exploration phase, right? So I'm asking, are you doing this via coaching or also doing groups? He responds primarily one-on-one, but I'm now starting to do small group coaching as well. And then because this person, and that's what you always have to adjust yourself to how they respond to you. This person was very, very brief, only like only one-liners. So I see, okay, not a good idea to try to build rapport and be super friendly because this person is obviously a professional, already making six figures, and they're talking to me. So I might as well just present them with the offer. And this was the offer to the close where I say, Stellar, sounds like a good plan. And I say, instead of boring you with more questions, how about we have a call? This is what I do. And uh, he said, sure, I would be open to seeing what you have to offer. And he then became a client. So this is how you do outbound prospecting. Do it like a human. Don't use automation or any other artificial connection methodologies. Just work like a human, but somebody who simply is interested in winning business. There's nothing wrong with that. And the worst thing that you they will do to you is to tell you, not interested, leave me alone. Well, big deal. Okay. But the reason why I'm saying that you might not want to do that, especially not want to do it too much, is because it does create a little bit of a negative aura, especially these people who did not like your approach will quite likely never engage with your content. Although I've experienced it as well that people who I started a conversation with then started liking my stuff, no problem, but you definitely help yourself more if you never do outbound prospecting because then everybody who you connect with and who you add value to, they will be happy to engage in your content and you're going to get traction faster in this way. And that is it. This will get you clients, right? If you follow this split of activities, connecting with people, growing your network, and really max out those 100 connection requests that LinkedIn gives you. Very many people that I know just don't do that. Absolutely do it. Then video podcast, 20% of the time, that is for the in-depth content for the relationship building. Because, you know, I feel that if you only were to focus on doing text posts on LinkedIn, it's, it's okay, but people do want to see also that you have something more to offer, that you are that you are also a good thinker, right? There's a reason why Joe Rogan has podcasts that last three or four hours, because it really allows you to dive into a topic. And having long-form content for those people who really enjoy 
listening to you who somehow find value in what you do, it's way better and you build relationships way more deeply if you are also doing long-form content. So definitely do a video podcast if you can. Then, of course, your own content. That's the bread and butter. Commenting, super important. That's why I give it so much space here when I'm starting out. And then prospecting. If you, A, need to validate an offer, if you, B, need to get clients through the door relatively quickly, and the more urgently you need to get clients through the door, prioritize prospecting more. And that's it. Thank you very much for, for joining. Are there any questions on the topics that we covered? Thank you, Kevin. Have a great day, Michael. Good to have, uh, good to have had you. Francesco, thank you for the comments. Anybody has a question? If not, we're going to wind up at this point. Thank you very much, everyone. See you around. The State of Client Acquisition is a Content360 production. Music by Gavin Knox Grant. To sign up for alerts and to submit written and audio questions, go to stateofclientacquisition.com. I'll talk to you in the next episode. Come